Hey there, folks. Welcome back to the YouTube live stage here at PAX Prime 2015. I'm Chris Waters from GameSpot.com here to talk about The Witcher 3 with Jacob and Travis from CD Projekt Red. Now, one of the greatest things about PAX is that developers from all over the world come travel, come talk about th their games, get to get on panels, and you guys are going to be talking about The Witcher 3 to, uh, on Sunday yeah. about adapting a game from a novel or a series of novels, I guess is more accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about that today. Uh, I guess first, before we get into it, Jacob, Travis, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about what you do at CD Projekt Red. Okay. Uh, so I'm a senior writer at CD Projekt Red. So basically I write the dialogue and come up with ideas for quests for The Witcher. All right. And I'm a translator, so uh, yeah, uh, Kuba, or that's what we call him over there, that's sort of Jacob in yeah. Polish. Uh, Kuba writes in Polish, and then we've got a team of two Polish-English translators, and we immediately put that right into English, and from there it hits the rest of the world, and it's translated in all the other languages. Yeah. And so. You guys certainly have your hands full, because there is just a ton of story, oh, yeah. a ton of dialogue and uh, in The Witcher 3, and it's all so good. It's one of the things that makes that game so wonderful and so immersive. Uh, let's talk like to sort of broad level like you know you guys had had some momentum from previous games But then there's also these books uh, Sapkowski's Witcher books that are so so popular uh, in Poland especially like how do you sort of chart a course? Like how, where do you even get started with charting a course for The Witcher 3 amongst all that lore that exists and amongst the story You've already told in The Witcher and The Witcher 2 well, so we knew from the beginning that this will be a huge challenge because we'll have to make a game which is accessible to people who haven't read the books and haven't played the previous games. And at the same time, we couldn't afford to disappoint our uh, fans who know all the books by heart and they know the games. Uh, so it was a very difficult balancing act to get it right. Uh, but I think in the end, it kind of worked out, so, so we were happy about it. Did you guys have like a required reading list that everyone <laughs> on the team had to like knock out before starting the project? We definitely uh, we, we tried to encourage everyone to read the books, which is kind of a challenge because our team has become quite uh, international, so we have a lot of people who aren't Polish, and uh, the last couple books aren't available in an official English translation. So, you know, we had to kind of point them towards some of the fan translations or give them summaries ourselves so they could get caught up on but all But those translations are underway, right? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I feel like, do you guys also, has? it seems like the, the success of The Witcher, the games, has fed back into, like, uh, real interest in the books. Has it been, has that been a cool sort of side effect of what you guys have been doing? Yeah, yeah, I think it's kind of a circle where uh, the success of the games encourages people to pick up the book and the other way around where people first start with the book and then they hear about the game and they pick it up. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think the books have becoming, uh, are becoming more popular in the US, which is great because they're a fantastic read. They're so fun and there's so many, like there's so much character in those books that really comes through in the game and sort of makes those books uniquely suited. Certainly in The Last Wish, it's like there's a bunch of just vignettes of just like, Yep, this kind of a standalone story of the time that Geralt was riding through the forest and he heard this strange sound and like went off and investigated it and it became this whole thing and like yeah. that's an experience you have in the game, mm. uh, which makes every one of those question marks so fiendishly mm -hmm. tempting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious to know when you guys think of, you know, you start thinking of a, a story that you want to tell in the game, do you think about okay, like how is this going to, what what quest beats, what actions do I want Geralt to do, or do you just think like? I want this to be a story first, and then I'll build in the quest structure after it. Or like, so which comes first? Is it chicken well, or the egg? It depends. So sometimes the impulse comes from the story team. So uh, we have an idea that we really want to introduce to the game, and then we discuss with the uh, guys on the gameplay side how we can do it best. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, they come up with us, and they tell us that they just came up with a new mechanic that they want to uh, uh, have a story around it. And actually, The Last Wish is a great example because we introduced the swimming and diving mechanic quite late in the development uh, because we initially didn't intend Geralt to be able to dive. Uh, and then when this uh, was done, uh, we were told that it would be great if we could incorporate that into the story. And actually, it's a big part of uh, the Last Wish quest, and I think it came together really, really well. Yeah, man. Although the first time you get under the water and mm. you see those drowners coming at you, that is yeah. definitely unnerving. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I, guess I have a question for you, uh, Travis, sort of in terms of translation, right? Mm. Because, uh, and I guess uh, you too, Jacob, there's so much, you know, translating a line of dialogue is one thing, but then you guys go into all of the monster names, and then you talk about all of the alchemical substances yeah. and the rune stones. Like, the, how do you like decide what kind of words you're even going to use and what 
for for this stuff. I mean, some of them exist in mm. in lore and stuff like that. But do you just make some of them up too? Yes, absolutely. Like uh, we we just. It differs depending on each one. Uh, sometimes we keep it quite close to the Polish word, but we try to make sure it'll actually be pronounceable in each target language. So like, for example, uh, one of the most iconic monsters in The Witcher 3 in Polish is the Leszy, and so we just changed that to Leszyn in English, sort of a slightly more pronounceable version. But other ones, like, um, for example, in the Baron Quest, you have this... I the think there's a Leshen fight going on over here next door, uh, actually. Yeah, that that like it. Here on the PAX Prime yeah. show floor. Either that or there's a revolution in the making. Uh -huh. <laughs> So you're saying about the Baron Quest? Well, yeah, the Baron Quest, you've got this, this little monster that is actually made from a, a, a dead fetus, a sort of miscarried fetus. And the word in Polish there is poroniec, which sort of conveys a lot of that specific information about what kind of monster that is. So that's, in those cases, we tried to make something up. You know, we called it a botchling, you know, something that was botched in its making and it come out. Uh, yeah, way to reference probably one of the number one creepiest creatures in your entire yeah. game. Good work, yeah. Travis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's interesting too, to like, because you also, The Witcher has this, uh, you know, it's sort of set in a world that's vaguely fairy tale, but it's also dark, but it's also funny. like. There are, there are these humorous twists in the books and in the games, and uh, I remember the one quest where uh, Geralt gets a little device that he can talk to uh, his mage friend over a long distance, called the Xenovox. Yeah. And he makes a crack about, oh, so wait, are these things just going to become super popular and every mage is going to be using them on every street corner? Like, what is your approach to humor and trying to get in those kind of modern tongue-in-cheek yeah. jokes? So, uh, of course, the Witcher world is primarily a dark fantasy RPG, but it's uh, an adventure which takes about 100 hours to complete. Uh, so we couldn't just keep w the same tone throughout because you'd get tired uh, quite quickly. Uh, so I think it's the change of tone and the change of uh, the feel of the quest that, that, that really uh, allows this moment to have a, a you know, to, to ring, to, to resonate with you. Yeah. So every once in a while, we, we want to lighten the mood, and, and uh, you know, we come up with, with, with some jokes to, to relieve the tension. It was pretty impressive, you guys. Like, you know, you slide in a Pulp Fiction reference, and it just feels yeah. totally normal. Like, yeah. yeah, this doesn't feel we, forced in, or doesn't, like, take me out of the experience at all. You know, that's something I think we'll talk a bit more about on Sunday, because that's actually there in Sapkowski as well. Like, he uh, definitely, uh, there's a lot of humor in there, and he does a lot of pastiche. He brings in stuff from different sort of media, different uh, from the present day, and so we kind of took some inspiration from him there as well. Now, when you guys are telling the story, there's, most of it is played out through, you know, through dialogue or through conversational scenes, uh, and then, of course, there's the, the quest descriptions that you read. Uh, but then there's also a few times in the game where you sort of flash away to parchment and ink, this animation as Geralt kind of uh, has it, like voices his internal monologue. How did, the, how did sort of that kind of scene sort of come about? Why did you guys think that was necessary? What, did, what problem did that solve to, like, to have that kind of scene in there? Do you want to take this? Yeah, sure. Well, we, we really like using those to show the consequences of your actions. I mean, whenever possible, we try to show those in the game world itself and through the dialogues. But sometimes there were things where it just didn't quite fit to have that in dialogue or a cutscene or something. And so that's uh, another way to just sort of say, yes, what you did is part of this whole living world. And what you did has these sort of effects. And, yeah. And that's how it turns and out. Sometimes we use it to show the conse consequence of your actions, which go beyond the game. Yeah. So uh, that you know that you've influenced the world in a in a significant way, but you won't see the consequence right away. It's something that will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those those kind of consequence trees. The I just I, I'm picturing like the design documents you guys must have oh, that yeah. just go on and on, mapping out contingency after contingency. Uh, did you ever get to, to the point where you wanted to do like another branch or another path, but it just became too much, and you had to say like, oh, we need to we need to wrap this up and move on to the next? Yeah, thing. yeah. The, the, there is this moment. We, we, of course, we wanted to give uh, flower players as much freedom as possible, but there is a, a point in which you have to say stop because otherwise you won't be able to wrap things up again. Uh, and also, doing an open world game with so much non-linearities non is even more difficult because you have to make sure that. 
all these quests work, and irrespectively of what decisions you made, and uh, irrespectively of the order in which you made it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like playing a giant Jenga game, where you just remove something, and then the entire structure yeah. collapses. So, so it was a, a lot of juggling to... to, to, to or uh, you remove something first. and wait to see. Yeah, is, yeah. Is it, gonna, is it gonna hold up? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that you know that is so rich about this game is the amount of like books that you can read and poems you can find and even the songs you hear. And I'm wondering, especially with the poems and the songs, there's a certain kind of structure to those that is not in the prose. You know, you could translate a paragraph yeah. of a quest description, but then you translate a paragraph of a song, and it's a much bigger challenge. Uh, can you talk a little bit about trying to do that, Travis? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Those are actually my, my favorite things to translate. When I when they throw in a poem or something, I'm like, yes, this is going to be fun because it is such a challenge. And well, what, what we usually try to do is, if it's rhyming in Polish, it'll rhyme in English. If it has a strict meter in Polish, it'll have some kind of meter in English, although never the same meter because just linguistically that doesn't work. Uh -huh. and, and so actually, this uh, my favorite quest to translate was uh, the uh, plays the thing, the one in no. Grad with the Doppler where you lure them out because that was all in rhyming couplets in Polish. And so it's just, I don't know, it just taxes your creativity so much to try to translate that stuff, but it ends up being a ton of fun. Did it. you ever go back to Jacob and you're like, dude, these lines are killing me. Can you just tweak them a little bit? Like, just give me something else oh. to work with? I, I recall there was this one case uh, where I wrote a dialogue where Gerald and Yennefer engaged in a sort of a verbal pun war uh, in uh, uh, in the one of the, one of the quests, uh -huh. uh, and and they basically uh, use proverbs or sayings to to kind of tease each other. Mm -hmm. And Travis came in and said, um, "Are you sure this is gonna end up in a game? Because if I spend my you know eight hours trying to make this work in English and then it's cut, I'm gonna be really angry." <laughs> so I had to uh, and you know reassure that this is definitely going to uh, be in the game, and, and it is. So and, and I think players like this scene quite a lot. Yeah, nice to good. hear about a little back and forth on the yeah. creative process. Mm -hmm. uh, and if anyone's at PAX, you guys can hear more about the back and forth of the creative process on Sunday. What time yeah. is the panel you have? 30 p.m. at the Hydra Theater. Fantastic. Uh, Jacob, Travis, thank you so much for coming on the stage here and talking about The Witcher 3. Folks, for more stuff on The Witcher 3 as the year continues and as we approach Game of the Year discussions later this year, go over to gaming.youtube.com slash GameSpot. Give us a star and you'll be up to date on all GameSpot's Witcher 3 content. Thanks for joining us here at PAX Prime, and we'll be live continuing with more game demos in just a minute.